right, well, it's good to be here. Um, I wish that light was warmer. <laughs> I, I kind of threaded the needle flying through storms coming here from South Dakota, and I thought Florida would be warmer. Um, all right, so this, uh, I'm going to talk to you about Pam. Um, we're celebrating a big milestone at this conference, and we have funded $10 million in research. Uh, and I'm going to say a little more about that. But if you don't know what PAM is, and many of you do, uh, we're here to tell you. So you're probably hearing a lot about PAM because we're promoting this live broadcast and trying to t give this big milestone um, some, some meaning for all the people that have received that funding and the beekeepers that have been served by all the projects that we do. So we started in 2006. PAM is a nonprofit organization, and we're funded it started with beekeepers and growers frustrated that the research that they wanted wasn't happening. And so they got their own money together and funded projects that they thought would be impactful for their bottom line. So that's how it started. It was a buck a hive from beekeepers and the almond growers who needed those hives. And then it grew into uh, corporate sponsorships and grants and um, we've been able to leverage that money to do a lot more work. And so I think many of you in this room were with Pam in the beginning. You saw how it came up. And this picture, this is from another uh, conference that I presented at. It's pretty amazing that over the years we're still doing what we do and we're growing. And this is a, a really great story about uh, a cause that has continued to grow and do good things for the industry. So uh, we fund research projects that are picked for their potential to impact beekeepers' actionable choices. Uh, we do that by putting out requests for proposals. Um, we say specifically the kinds of things that we're interested in. We have a long list of projects that we funded, and you can see it on our website in a searchable database. Uh, the board is comprised by beekeepers that keep us true to that mission, and they are the ones that select the projects that we fund. Uh, and we come to these meetings, and we get good ideas, and we see the research projects, and try to bring people together to, to hear what the needs are and keep in touch, and then take action and do what we can to help. Now, a lot of bee health problems uh, need research, and we do a lot of, if you're worried about it, Pro Project APSM is probably studying it. Um, but we also know that the best thing you can do for a stressed or a sick bee is have some good nutrition on the ground to move that colony through that generation and try to get them to replenish with a new healthy cohort. So it's not strictly research. We also fund putting forage back around, working with agriculture to try to put more healthy nutrition on the ground for bees. There's a few of us that get paid to work at PAM. Uh, we run with a lot of volunteers, but this is the staff. And we don't have a brick and mortar. We're spread out around the country. We do a lot of virtual work, and we travel to meetings. Um, th several of us are here today. I can't point. The one with the we're growing is Sarah. She's here. Grace, but with the red background, is here in the trade show. So if you come by the PAM booth, you'll meet one of us. Um, and we have another new person coming on in January in California. So. These are the worker bees at PAM. We fund about 20 research projects a year. Uh, we plant about 18,000 acres of primarily cover crops around almond orchards. Um, and we're getting really good at finding ways to get information back to beekeepers. So closing that loop. It's not enough to do the research. You have to deliver it to the end user in a way that they can see how that fits with their options and choices. So making this live broadcast possible is part of that, so that people who can't come to this meeting are able to see and uh, hear the good work that's happening. The science proposals we get are very technical. Uh, science changes pretty quickly. And we rely on, you know, the beekeepers don't pick the research projects necessarily based on the science. We have them vetted by a board of experts. These are the research scientists, many of whom you've heard speak here or are speaking at the research conference. And they're dedicated to finding good research projects and 
they review everything uh, for the materials and methods and make sure that that science is sound. And then they give recommendations to the board based on the, their reviews. We review three times a year. And so anytime you have an idea, you can go to the PAM website and submit it and know that it's going to be seen soon. And we can fund out of cycle. So if something comes up that's urgent, we can take action. But they do a ton of work. So they review 50 to 80 proposals and applications a year. Um, and they have decades of experience and a, a multitude of expertises. So uh, we could not do what we do without these dedicated scientists. So we're very grateful. And probably the greatest resource at PAM is our board. So you'll recognize some familiar faces. Uh, it's, these are people that are actually operators and practitioners in beekeeping, many of them multi-generation. Um, they make all the decisions to decide where funding goes. Um, so they're steering the ship to keep us true to the mission. And they're also fundraising for PAM. So uh, if you have ideas about what we should be doing or if you'd like to support us or learn more, reach out to any of these board members. So the beekeeper and grower, people often see what we're funding and want to know where the money comes from. So we get, uh, like I said in the beginning, beekeepers and growers donated to PAM and this graph shows those donations over the years. And uh, you know we have a pretty steady, but this is, this is kind of the small uh, axis, so 350,000 there on the top. We really appreciate this funding. We know that we're not gonna be able to do as much with money if we're just relying on the beekeeping industry to fund it all. But what we can do with this money, and on this next graph, the little gray bottom of these bars is the same numbers that were on the last graph. So that foundation of beekeeper support and grower support is important as a vote of confidence for Pam that you support what we're doing. But using that money, we can go to other corporate sponsors and we can go to big um, organizations so, and, and get funding to support more research. So somebody like Costco, for example, gives us funding, and that's in blue. So this is the corporate money that we've been able to get. Pam can't keep that money. It's called pass-through because they give us the money to put into research. The National Honey Board is an example. Bayer funds a Healthy Hives initiative through Pam. So they give us money, and we have to choose research projects to put it into. Um, so it's a great story to look at how much we've been able to grow the funding for research. Here's another way to look at it, and you can see some of our larger sponsors, Costco and Costco Canada. Um, most PAM funding is available in Canada, and anywhere actually, but it needs to be relevant for our own industry and our own beekeepers here. So we do get some applicants and, and fund, the, the Canadian funding is growing, we're at about a uh, million dollars in Canada. National Honey Board, uh, the Christy Heinz Memorial Award, so we have a variety of beekeeping uh, fun, uh, funding sources uh, that added up to that 10 million. So some of the things we funded over the years research on these topics, and like I said, there's a database on the PAM website that you can dig deeper into each of these and see summaries that are written for a normal person to read, which is a nice way to have some digested research. And over those years, all those projects added up to about 164 projects. Uh, we fund scholarships, so trying to get the next generation of scientists to support tomorrow's problems, because we know we're not gonna ever solve all the problems, but we do wanna grow the industry support in different research labs. So graduate students, and you've heard from a lot of them, uh, receive quite a bit of PAM funding. So I give these talks at meetings and somebody, um, you know, we've been in this bee crisis for a long time. Somebody said, tell us something good. What is the good news? What, are, what can you tell us about progress you're making? And there is good news. It's not just all bad news. Uh, the good news is we know what's wrong. In the beginning, we hear a lot of CCD, cell phone, like there's a lot of crazy ideas about what's wrong and what's killing bees, but we know it's not a mystery. There's some very basic things that we can work on and, um, 
And those are the four Ps. You see those things on most talks about bee health. And we know what to do. If we had a magic wand, we could put more resources into these uh, and make progress. We, um, and Pam is doing a lot of that. So we feel like we're doing a good job at asking for projects, choosing the good ones, and getting that money out there quickly to have uh, an impact. So we feel good about the process. And in the rest of the world, brands are stepping up. So we heard from Blue Diamond. Uh, you're hearing about all these bee-friendly declarations to, uh, like, we're going to have bee-friendly almonds and things like that. So I, I think it's, we're surprised that everybody is still co so concerned about bees. But uh, I don't think it's going away. People have a lot of love for bees. Um, and we're seeing that brands realize if they can associate with a cause that the consumers care about bees. And as beekeepers, you are advocates and it doesn't, it's no surprise to you that people love bees and if you say you're a beekeeper then pretty soon you're telling the stories and, and people really want to know and they care about bees. You may not know the extent of it though. Uh, this is a survey National Geographic did with their Facebook viewers. Uh, so. These are people that are paying attention to, to nature, and they asked, if you could dedicate your life to saving one species, what would you choose? And you can see far and away, the bee stole the show. Um, and there's some pretty charismatic organisms on that list, but people really have an affinity and are fond of bees. So that gives us, um, the attention that we need to reach out and, and connect those people who want to help bees to what we can do to help bees through PAM. So here's the four Ps. We, the, the primary focus of our work is things like parasites, uh, the varroa mite and the pathogens it vectors, poor nutrition, and when we say poor nutrition, a lot of that is not necessarily supplements for the bees, although we study that as well, but it's more about the landscape and natural forage, natural nutrition. How do we, how do we have good support for bees on the landscape? So both of those areas. And pesticides, of course, are a big problem for bees, and we have a lot of projects on those. Uh, Varroa is probably the, the number one problem. Um, there's some there's arguably other problems that are as bad as Varroa, but the hard thing is we need more Varroa tools. We, we have a tool that works, um, and we have a variety of tools that have a variety of uses, but there's not a lot of things in the pipeline to, uh, to look forward to for Varroa. There's, we've had some really great specific compounds that treat Varroa, but the beekeeping industry isn't big enough to really attract a lot of that work to develop new tools. Uh, but there is hope. Uh, this project, and Jay mentioned it in Canada, uh, the DRTT here in the US, this is a new molecule discovered, um, actually synthesized by a chemist in Canada. And Pam funded this. They're, they're having really good luck. They've been through the cages. They're now into the colonies. Um, it's a reasonable compound to produce. And they're studying it, and we just did a, a, a presentation of their progress, and this is on Inside the Hive TV. So if you're curious how that project is going, there's a lot of really great information about the chemistry and the process that they went through. And as they're doing this, they're also coordinating. You can see Steve Cook's picture down there. He's at the USDA in Jay's, Jay's lab in Beltsville, and uh, he's keeping in contact with them and they're working together so that if it does get registered in Canada, it can also be fast-tracked in the US. So this tool will hopefully be efficiently delivered to both countries as soon as it can be. And it's going well. Uh, research is a really long game. So it's, it's hard to say and, and quantify the return on investment in research because it takes a long time for things to come to fruition. But this is a great story. We've talked about varroa resistance and how great it would be to have bees that can help themselves. Uh, we have a lot of projects on that. But this one in particular, the reason that beekeepers don't have it is because it's difficult. It's really hard to, to determine which bees are varroa resistant. There's these liquid nitrogen tests that you can kill brood. Um, but that, you know, not everybody is going to make the, 
the commitment to do this year over year. So you see a picture there of the PVC tubes and you put that on a brood and you pour liquid nitrogen in there. If we had an alternative way for beekeepers to find their best stocks uh, that was quick and easy to test, uh, and you could look in your own bees and find the ones you like, that would be a great way to make some progress here. And that's happening. So over the years, uh, there's been a lab studying these uh, volatile chemical compounds that, what are the signals that bees use to open up and remove problems in the brood, like mites? And it takes a long time to collect those compounds and study them and synthesize them and then test them again to make sure you got the thing right. But over the years, that has been happening in uh, Kara Wagner's lab. And she is now testing a product that is a spray to do exactly this. And this is a really cool story because she was one of our first scholars supported by Costco Money in 2013. So now, just nine years later, she's actually brought that work with many years of support and patience and hard work to a product that is for beekeepers to use. So that's almost... Uh, available. It's in the final stages of testing now. So we're really excited about that. Uh, indoor storage is one practice that really is changing our industry. Um, this is a, uh, it, it's not new. They've stored bees indoors in cold places like in Canada for a long time, but it's usually repurposed buildings. And it was originally just to protect the bees from so much cold. But now the problem isn't just the cold, the problem is all these warm days that you have and the erratic weather and as climates change and everything becomes unpredictable, if you can put your bees somewhere that's predictable, you can have some peace of mind. And so beekeepers are building these very elaborate, expensive, technical buildings to store their bees. That's a big step to take. So um, as the interest is growing, we gather up the, the beekeepers that are having good success and the researchers that are studying this to learn more so they can learn from each other. And this year we had the second indoor storage conference. We've developed an indoor storage guide. So that if you're interested to see if a building is worth it and it's gonna work for your business model, you can take this resource and learn from the current state of the practice and the research that's happening about indoor storage. So, these conferences are virtual because we started this during COVID, um, but one innovation that we have is to give a tour. So we send a film crew, the same film crew that is filming us right now, to these places to talk to the people that built this thing and um, get, essentially take you there. So it's just a live tour of what's happening right there and asking questions and showing the people and the, the components of the building. And uh, this is all online too, so it's free. You can find it on YouTube and watch it at your convenience and zip through uh, a little faster. And this year's was just last month and um, it was a tour of the Asher's building. So last year we were in Idaho buildings. There's a lot of storage in Idaho. And this year we went to the Imperial Valley in California, which is a really hot area to see how they're using them actually with a lot of different practices that you may not think of using a building, but they actually find ways to use it year round and it's been a really valuable tool even in the hot climate. So this is a, a video that was from that trip of Brandon Hopkins and Brian Ashurst. I'm Brandon Hopkins, uh, assistant research professor at Washington State University. And I'm Brian Ashurst, uh, beekeeper here in Southern California in the Brill Valley. I'm always hitting them up for, for help in doing in these bee projects and yeah, bugging them. And I appreciate Brandon's approach to a lot of this because I think he looks at it in a real world, um, what the beekeeper really is looking for and what he needs. The importance of research and, the, and to the American beekeeper is huge. Nobody is more interested in saving the bees. You hear a lot of this, oh, we got to save the bees, we got to save the bees. Who's the most interested in saving the, the bees? Is the American beekeeper. So when you support Pam, you're supporting the American beekeeper. When you buy American honey, ask for US 
made honey, you're supporting the American beekeeper. Just by doing those small acts, giving a little bit of money to, for research, buying U.S. honey, you're supporting the American beekeeper, and the American beekeeper cares about keeping bees alive more than anybody. It means everything to, to be able to do this research, to have folks like Brian who are uh, interested in, in the research and moving the industry forward and forward thinking like that is amazing. Yeah, I like it when researchers are listening to what we're looking for and are, are thinking, okay, how is this gonna be in the field? Yeah, this might be practical in the lab, it might work, on a small scale, but when there's thousands of hives, you can't do it this way. So I like the approach of, okay, how are we gonna move forward the industry as opposed to just always the science. The science is important, don't get me wrong, but we also need to know what's moving us forward, what's gonna work for us today. We're all looking for solutions today because uh, we're under pressure today. So I think that what Brian said there that the science is important, but we really want the research that's going to move the industry forward. So not just science for its own sake, but really applied work. And we have beekeepers, uh, many of them, who loan their uh, businesses to projects because Brandon's research couldn't happen without a beekeeper to help him study. The, the research infrastructure just isn't there. Until, and so the beekeeper that supports a project in his own operation or hers um, is allowing that to go forward. That's a big contribution. And I think some of our most exciting projects are incubated in beekeeping businesses. Here's an example. Uh, Vanessa is here. I'm not sure what, if she, she spoke. I think she's speaking in the other meeting. But uh, a couple years ago, there was a researcher panel with beekeepers. And uh, Blake Shook stood up and said, I spend a lot of money on supplemental feed for my bees. I don't have the information that I would like, the data about those to know the return on investment. Could you study that? And Vanessa is a nutrition scientist in Tucson. She said, yeah, that, I could study the supplements and look at that in Tucson. And Blake said, well, Tucson's great and you can learn some things, but it would be really nice to know how it, how it impacts the bees in my own operation. And because we know that management is really important part of the questions that you want answered. So he said, how about we use a truckload of my trucks, uh, or a truckload of my bees, and you come out and we'll put the supplements on the different colonies, and you follow us when we do our migratory beekeeping and, um, and study them that way, and then you can take them back to the lab and still do the good science, but do it in a real world setting. And so that happened, and this is also, uh, a, a, these are the products that they're testing and comparing, and they're having some real differences in the, the results, so they're getting some clear answers. This is sponsored by the Healthy Hives Initiative uh, funding, and if you wanna learn more about that, Vanessa and Blake talked about their results on a webinar, and that's also on PAM's YouTube, so you can zoom through that. Another project being supported in a beekeeper's operation is in Browning's Honey with Katie Lee. Uh, this is answering the question that beekeepers often have about queen replacement. I know my queens need replacing. They still look good. Should I replace them? Uh, what's, what's the economics of making those choices and decisions? Does it matter if she looks good or uh, can I trust that? So Katie and Zach worked on that exact question uh, they wanted to know if, if your judgment about a queen looking good pays off in the end or if it's better to just replace them all. Um, and this is something that we're going to have a webinar with Katie and Zach to report out. So if you watch the PAM website, we also have a QR code that you can get our newsletter. It's usually once a quarter or less. And it will link you to these events, so our Facebook page is a good way to find us as well. Um, and once we do it, we just put it out there, and just like these talks, it'll be there forever, so you can access it uh, anytime. Another really cool project uh, that I'm excited about is this issue. We know that bee pasture is an issue that is not going away. Uh, as the amount of resources for all bees shrinks, uh, the concern about how they're using that and competing uh, grows. And there's a lot of groups, conservation groups, that are saying the honeybee's the bad bee. And we need to understand what's happening out there and get good science so that we can enter these conversations with good solutions. Um, and so this is a, a study 
the problem is most of what we have is honeybee researchers, but there is a lab in the USDA that has the expertise of not just honeybees, but bumblebees, uh, solitary bees, and this is Diana Cox Foster's lab in Logan. And so you may have heard that there was a petition to keep bees off of Forest Service federal lands, and out of that came uh, the opportunity because Darren Cox in Utah, another beekeeper that wanted to support this project, said, I have apiaries that are on those kinds of lands and have been there a long time. Diana, could you come and study the difference it makes to have an apiary and put these other bee species out there and make good, rigorous comparisons about what's happening on that landscape? And they did that. They did it out in those apiaries uh, that were kind of, they were remote just like Forest Service land permitted uh, apiaries. They also did it in cages. So the, the real question that we want to get to is what do we have to do to make all bees healthy? So how do we, Pam does a lot of work supplementing forage. Um, what is, how much forage does it take and what kinds of forage are gonna be best for all bees? So that, that's the next step that they can take, not only documenting how they interact, but also how can we be part of the solution for making all bees healthy. I put a picture of Christy Hines up there because a really cool outcome of this project was funding for a student, uh, Jesse Tabor. And it's hard to study floral resources on land. We always have the question, how much, how much can this part of the, the land support? How many colonies? What's the carrying capacity? And it's hard to walk through and measure that. Uh, if we had a way to do it without having to walk through and count flowers and bees, that would be really great. And uh, this is a project, you see this orange thing, that's a drone, and there's Jesse about to fly it. He's able to fly over the landscape and resolve the flowers on the ground. So each pixel shows a half centimeter on the ground. And he can fly 80 acres in 30 minutes. So that's a really powerful tool that's probably going to move this forage research more quickly along to answer questions. In just his studies, he was able to characterize seven species of flowers using this drone technology, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's a lot of land out there that isn't very useful for bees. Um, and this is another Utah project. Utah doesn't have a lot of water. That's a real resource issue. Uh, and how can we, if we could find something that would successfully grow on those western lands that are drought stricken, uh, that would be a great resource for bees. That would be a big improvement. And this is Kevin Jensen. He's a, his, he's a career scientist at ARS, and he's a plant geneticist, and it's his job to find plants that will grow in these drought-stricken drought lands, so without irrigation. And here we see pictures of failed CRP mixes, which is uh, supposed, you know, I do, this is what people do with fallow land. They get these seed mixes, um, and they don't always work because they need more water. So Kevin's job is to rehabilitate those lands, and most of his the people interested in his research are cat, they have cattle on that land. But you can actually plant things that is good for cattle and also good for bees. So here we have the, um, oops, back. So this is a, a drought index and you don't really have to read it to see that this is in Nephi, Utah, which is very, very dry. And Kevin planted this, this on the right in 17 and 18, 2017 and 2018, and saw the, the flower, Diana saw these flowers, and she's in the Logan lab and saw what Kevin was doing, and uh, went down there and said, I think bees would really like this. So she, even all these years later with no irrigation, she went down there and did some collecting and found all these bees were using it. So we said, and this was a, a cooperation that had never happened before, Diana and Kevin, said let's do a few years study and uh, see if we can rehabilitate these lands for use for bees. So we got this new scientist and this new collaboration to help and this was just in November planting these PAM seed mixes in Nephi, Utah. So we're excited to tell you more about that soon. Uh, I think it was last year Judy Wu Smart talked about this project here or two years ago and it was a very shocking talk about pesticides on seed corn that was 
disposed of improperly. Um, and this is a picture of those green piles are, are wasted waste corn and dead bees. Her research apiaries were dying. And you've heard about this project, uh, so I'm not going to say a lot about it, but research outcomes. Uh, we were able to move quickly and fund this. She had a hard time finding funding for it. Uh, and the National Honey Board money helped her get started right away. And I just want to direct your attention to the bottom outcomes. So not only are they doing the good science and it's going to take a long time, but they've had uh, an interdisciplinary consortium come and train students and that action has now led to legislative changes in four states to make sure that this loophole is closed and this can never happen again. So that's a really great outcome too. Uh, PAM funds components of projects, so sometimes it's not the whole project, but in California, for example, uh, there's a lab there that is, has a really big grant to study pesticides and realize that uh, one of the groups of chemicals requires a separate test and came to Pam and said, can we add pyrethrins uh, and will you pay for that to supplement this grant? And we know those are important for pollinators, so uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about that from Neil Williams soon. Uh, adjuvants are added to pesticides and this is something that you hear a lot about because a lot of them are supposed to be bee safe and they're not regulated the same way uh, as other pesticides. And so Reed Johnson, who's the guy that you want studying this kind of thing, uh, he's studying adjuvants to see are the bee safe ones actually bee safe. And the ones that are bee safe, and this is a really cool innovation, can we use those in our own varroa treatments because they're bee safe to make the treatments more effective and get a, a boost of, with some of these tools, which is a really great approach, I think. So uh, look for that from Reed. Uh, how many of you saw this talk yesterday? Very uh, exciting and scary talk about tropolay laps. Pam is funded. This is actually the only proposal we've gotten about tropolay laps, but we were glad to fund it, and we funded that for Sammy in 2021. Uh, and actually, oops. Uh, in 2018, that should say 2018, we funded Sammy's project through his advisor, Dennis Van Engelsdorp, on what do varroa feed, which is the study that rewrote the textbooks. And it was only like a $16,000 study for a student, and Sammy had this idea, and it changed everything. And now we know that they're attacking the fat bodies, which is the bee's immune system. It's much more important than uh, just the, the hemolymph or the blood. So we're excited about this. Uh, I'm sure when you saw that talk, you were alarmed. And I think it's hard to watch that and not think, why aren't we doing any? What, what, what do we need to do to be prepared for this? And so yesterday afternoon, we had planned to bring together uh, apiary inspectors who are the front lines looking for this and trying to uh, collect samples and watch. So there are, there are surveys happening, not enough and not very many. Uh, and the researchers who study this, some of them from other countries, um, to talk about what can we do to be better prepared. What's the low-hanging fruit? What are the steps to have a task force and address tropolay laps and get started? We're behind. Let's catch up. So that meeting went really well, and we hope to have a task force moving forward to figure out what to do if we see tropolay laps. How do we educate people to watch for it? And how do we prevent it? And right now, advancing tropolay lapse knowledge is a priority in the re request for proposals that's open at PAM. So uh, you can go to our website if you, uh, if, if you apply for research funding. That's happening right now. And this is the Healthy Hives Initiative funded by Bayer. Uh, Seeds for Bees is our California program. So I'm going to transition to the forage part of the story now. And this is in almonds, which is an, a really important partner for PAM. Uh, the almond industry, or sorry for beekeepers, the almond industry is a, where the bees are going every year. And there's a lot of bare ground, and water is an important resource. And so uh, it makes good sense for the orchards. And we call the program Seeds for Bees, but it's probably more important for the soil. Uh, if, whew, sorry. So the Seeds for Bees program is a PAM program to offer uh, free cover crop seed to growers who are willing to try this practice. 
Um, and this is Roy Crowley, he's a grower himself, but he's working now on, on developing this program. And we had a huge year this year. The, the, the acreage went way up. You can see on the right there that bar has been growing year over year, but this was a big jump. 47% increase, and most of that is in almonds, although other crops can also apply for free cover crop seed. Uh, and we got uh, Blue Diamond applied for a Climate Smart Commodity Grant, and Seeds for Bees is a component of this, and they were awarded the only Climate Smart Commodity Grant in almonds, which is really great. So this is a five-year growth plan for this program. Uh, we have a seed drill to plant the the cover crop more efficiently uh, and deliver that program better. And we're starting with some carbon sequestration measurements. We have a pilot study for that in the program because that's actually a, a, a growing interest uh, for all agriculture and for these climate concerns. Uh, and the seed was delivered in October. So in California, the precipitation that helps this grow and bloom in time for uh, the bees when they're delivered in the in January and February, has to be in the ground in October to get that advantage for the bloom time. So how it works, we have seed options you can choose from. Uh, the cost of the seed, you get a, a free seed. So the first year you get a discount on your seed, and also the second year shipping is always free. And most of the people that participate in this program continue with it after those subsidies years. Uh, and of course, the, the technical advice, add, asking somebody to add a management practice is a big step. So having that person to tell you how to, uh, how to, to answer your questions is really important, and that's Rory. We also have some uh, science on that to ground truth that program. So for example, uh, does it use more water? Um, does it put my almonds at frost risk? Uh, we have a project that's happening to measure the the whole year water balance in these orchards with and without these cover crops so that we have data to answer those concerns of growers. And this is a cool program because it, uh, it links together our industry partners like the Almond Board and Blue Diamond with supply chain partners, so Costco um, and Bayer and these, these products that use almonds can also contribute to support this program and uh, for the almonds that they use, and PAM is the delivery mechanism to complete this circle. So it's a really beautiful system that's it's gaining a lot of interest in supply chain partnerships. And as I said, there's a lot, uh, as, as we make this more visible, the markets are responding and there's top-down change, like Kind Bar saying we're gonna source bee-friendly almonds in all of our products by 2025. That's a big statement. And when one brand does that, then other brands also um, come along. So Walmart uh, and, of course, Blue Diamond Growers, we see Purdue Farms adding pollinator-friendly habitat on their uh, solar installations. So as this catches on, uh, there's a, a, a momentum that's gained with all these pro uh, partners. So, we have a lot of resources if you want to learn more about cover crops. Thank you. There's a, a practical guide. So we try to put a lot of practical information on our website. So you may have seen these guides. This, this is the indoor storage guide, uh, the shipping honeybee queens and queen cells and queen banking. So these are very practical and they'll kind of give you schematics and resources to find the materials that you need to do that. Um, those are all printable from our website. So whatever information you'd like to uh, grab is on our website and you can print it and it's free. And this is the one about cover crops. So this is, if you want your almond growers to consider cover crops, there's a single page that walks you through the year uh, and has links that you can find more information. So you can find that on our website. Okay, so this is the PAM booth. Um, we, many of you are familiar with uh, George Hansen's paintings. Over the years, he's used those paintings to uh, gain support for organizations that he dedicates his time to. So there's often a painting at the auction 
at the banquet that goes for many thousands of dollars. And George, who's on the PAM board, generously donated one that uh, you can get for just a, a smaller donation, and you can get your ticket for that at the, uh, at the PAM booth, and it's a beautiful spoonful of honey. So thank you, George, for that. And this is uh, Sarah Brown, who is at the booth in our newest hire, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm.